All right, guys. If you're watching this, thank you for tuning in. Um, United Worship Evangelism Team. I am excited about these couple weeks that I get to teach and do a little training on this. Tonight, I want to be very practical. Um, I'm not going to get real in-depth in teaching. I am going to teach a little bit, but I want to be practical with you guys. I want, I want to give you guys practical things to walk out going about doing evangelism, what's important, what's not. Those are the things I really want to hit tonight. Um, but before we do that, um, if you guys are wondering why my eye looks crazy, I have an eye infection. I found out from the doctor today, and it has been driving me crazy. So if you see me messing with it, um, that's why. I didn't get punched or anything like that. I hurt so bad this morning, I seriously thought that I was going to end up looking like Will Collins afterward. But good thing good thing I just needed some eye drops, and that was it. Um, yeah, hey, real quick, I just want to do this. Can we, before we get started in this lesson, can we give a shout out to Joanne? I think she's doing an awesome job. You know, I've heard updates of things they're doing um, with the grocery stores, the hospital, the police station, everything like that. I think we need to like drop her like a thousand emojis on the comments and just show her some appreciation. So show her some love. I think she's doing a great job, even in the midst of this crazy season. I think it's so cool that she's still finding ways, you know, she's working with Steve and working with some other people, still finding ways to minister, to share the gospel. It's so, so cool and so creative and it's just awesome. So if you guys could throw, throw some comments up there for, for Joanne and, uh, and yeah, we're going to go ahead and get started. So, um, so real quick tonight, one of the things we're going to be going over, one of the things we're going to be talking about is going. Last week we talked a little bit about why evangelism. Why do we go? Why do we do evangelism? And and I just want to kind of expound on that and and just what do we need to go? What do we need to go do evangelism? Because I think that's the biggest thing holding people back is a lot of times we just don't ever muster up the courage or the the I guess the passion to actually go do the stuff, right? And we are called to go do the stuff. I think all of us have what it takes. All of us have it inside of us. What we need to do to go preach the gospel, see people saved. You know, there was a super interesting quote. Um, not a quote. I shouldn't say that. There was an interesting study done by the Barna Group not that long ago. And the Barna Group put out this put out this um, this stat that said only two percent of Christians. Will, will ever lead a person to Jesus in their lifetime. And I thought to myself, that is a staggering statement, and it is extremely disappointing. I don't know about you guys, but I, that, that disappoints me because I think we need to be teaching and training people to go do the stuff, people to go out and preach the gospel, people to go out and share the gospel. That's what we do. That's what the church is. The church isn't just us meeting up on Sunday morning. So I want to hit on that a little bit. I want to reference a passage real quick as we get started. Matthew 22, 1 through 10, and verse 14. Um, actually, you could just go 1 through 14 in Matthew chapter 22. I'm not going to read it just for time's sake. But most of us know this, this parable. Jesus is speaking to them in parables. And he gives this parable about the, a wedding banquet. And it's about a king and, and, you know, his son's getting married. And he says, go out and invite this select group of people to the wedding. And he sends his servants out. The first group of people has their first response. First response is this. Everybody says, no, no, we're not going to do that. No, we're not going to go. We, we just don't want to, basically. And then number two, you have another group of people. And the second group of people, what they did was they made excuses. They said, well, we have business to tend to. We have other family issues to attend to. And we have all these other things going on, which sounds really common and this is inviting people to follow Jesus, inviting them to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And this is what we're called to do. And, and it said the second group of people totally just made excuses. And I think that's kind of where we live right now. A lot of people will make excuses why not to follow Christ. And like I said last week, though, that should never hold us back from going. You know, that should never hold us back from going. People's response should never hold you back from going out and preaching the gospel. Jesus rode into Jerusalem knowing he was going to get crucified, knowing he was going to get rejected. And yet he still rode into Jerusalem. He still went in. He still went into the city. As he looks over Jerusalem, it says that he weeps and he cries 
and he, he loves the people. And, and we have to understand that, that Jesus loves everybody and everybody deserves an opportunity to hear the gospel, even if they reject it, even if they make excuses on why not to follow Jesus. And then you have the last group of people. And, and this group of people is us, basically. It's, it's the Gentiles. He says, he says, go to them and go to the highways. He said, invite the good and the bad. And, and he goes on to this thing and he's like, you know, invite the good and the bad. And those people came, the poor, the broken, the weak, the weary. This is us. This is the Gentiles, the broken, the poor, the needy. And they come to Jesus and, and they come to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And all these other people had excuses or they had a no of just why they couldn't come. But they missed out on the wedding banquet. And, and then I think it's really interesting. We get this really famous quote. Um, from Jesus that a lot of people I've heard so many different sermons on it. He says many are called but few are chosen in verse 14 <laughs> You know, I've heard a lot of messages on this But if you break down the parable well, you could say okay What is Jesus trying to say many are called but few are chosen the ones who are chosen? All of them were called right all of them were called to the wedding banquet at one time or another everybody is called to the table with Jesus everybody is called to Jesus and and we're called to follow Jesus we're called to come to the marriage supper of the lamb he's he's paid for us he's paid a price for us but he says everybody was called many were called but few were chosen who were the chosen ones to come to the wedding they were the ones who said yes and I, I don't know about you, but we need to have our yes to Jesus needs to be the loudest thing in our life. The loudest cry in your heart has to be your yes to Jesus. And it's amazing when you read this scripture that anybody and everybody could come. He said, go to the highways and byways. And that's what we do as an evangelism team, as people, followers of Jesus. That's what we're supposed to do. Go to everywhere. Go to every person, good and bad highways and byways and preach the gospel share the gospel with them invite them in to the marriage supper of the lamb invite them into a relationship with jesus that is what we are called to do and it's disappointing that most of the church sits by idly and never never takes the opportunity to do what jesus is calling them to do and all we have to do is go just go share the gospel preach the gospel it's pretty simple but most people make it way more complicated than it has to be. And I'm telling you, it's not complicated. It's actually not. It's it, it's actually really easy. Some of the stuff you'd probably do in church is harder than the things that you would do out on the streets. And so so I, I just want to say a few things to you guys here about this passage of scripture. Um, think about the servants. He sends out servants to go invite them. I'm telling you, now that we've said yes to Jesus, this is us. We are the servants going out to the highways and byways to share the gospel. I, I, if you look at the scripture and you really, really look at it, um, you know, he's really referring to the Old Testament and the Old Testament prophets when he talks about the first group of servants that went out and they were rejected and beaten and all this stuff. And then he sends out another group. He sends out the armies first and then he sends out another group of servants and he says, go to the highways and byways, invite the good and the bad He's talking about the Gentiles and, you know, the, the non-Jewish people. Go invite them, too. And, and that's what we do. We invite anybody and everybody, good and bad. That's the gospel. That's the era we live in. <clears throat> I want to read a passage to you guys real quick. This is going to be kind of my main, my main hit on tonight. And then I'm going to get into some super practical points on doing evangelism. So, I read this scripture this morning, and it just struck me that it was perfect for tonight. Um, I'm going to start in 2 Corinthians 5.18, and it says this. It says, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, for he himself knew no sin, became sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. That is an amazing passage of scripture. I love it. It's one of my favorites for sure. But he says, he came to reconcile us to himself. 
And now we have been given the ministry of reconciliation that we're called to go and we're called to make this plea to people and say, come be reconciled to God. Jesus Christ has made a way. Jesus Christ has made a way for you to be in right relationship with God. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be any of that. All you have to do is come to Jesus and enter into a relationship with him. And that's all it takes. That's all it takes to be reconciled back to God, to stand in the blood of Jesus, perfectly washed, perfectly justified. That is what Christ did, and he's calling us to now go. So, so Jesus made reconciliation for us. He was a minister of reconciliation, and now we're called to minister reconciliation to other believers. That's what we're supposed to do. We're, we're, we're ministering, and we're reconciling people back to God. That's our message. Let, let me tell you guys this. I'm going to hit this in a few minutes. When we go out and preach the gospel, let me tell you guys one thing. I've gone out and preached the gospel a lot, probably for about 10 years almost. I've gone out and shared the gospel in the streets and stuff like that. I'll tell you this. I don't think the most effective way, and I'm not saying this is always true, 99% of the time, the most effective way to reach somebody is not going to tell them, not going to be to tell them that they're going to go to hell when they die. No, it's, it's actually better off to tell them Jesus loves you and he paid a price for you to be reconciled to God because he loves you that much and all he wants is a relationship with you. I've seen more fruit from that than anything else. I'm telling you, you catch more flies with honey than vinegar. That's, that's all there is to it. You catch more flies with honey than vinegar. People want to feel the love of Christ and they need to feel the love of Christ. And I'm going to get into that here in a minute. We're inviting people to be reconciled to God when we go out and we share the gospel. That's what we're doing. That's our number one goal. Our number, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself, sorry. So number one, I want to make like seven quick points to you guys, and I just want to break them down. First of all, if you're listening to this, you need to go. You need to go out. You need to share the gospel. You need to, you need to be out there. You're called to this. It, it says in the Great Commission, go. <laughs> Go make disciples. We are called to go. That's all there is to it. I, I, you, I mean, you can make all the excuses in the world, but we need to quit making excuses because most excuses are based around the fear of man. We're scared of what people will think of us. I'd say almost all fear on going out and preaching the gospel is you're afraid God won't use you or you're afraid God won't show up or you're just afraid what people will think, that they won't think you're good enough, that they don't think you have what it takes, that you'll be embarrassing or something like that. That's nonsense. That's nonsense. If God told you to do it, he's equipped you to do it. He'll fill your mouth. That's all there is to it. That's what we have to understand. I think what's more fearful than failing while doing evangelism, not having the right words to speak, I think what's more fearful than that is not what people will think. What's more fearful is not being obedient to Christ. Not being obedient because he's told us to do it. And we, a lot of us know, a lot of you guys who are going to listen to this video, I believe he's already called you and told you things that he wants you to go do and share. And maybe you've held back, but you need to quit making excuses, all of us, even people on the evangelism team. We need to not make excuses on why we can't preach the gospel, why we can't share the gospel to somebody. I remember one time we were out sharing the gospel in Youngstown, and I remember we were at a mall, and I remember I got like this word of knowledge where I saw this group of young teenagers and one of them was on crutches and as we, they were on the other side of the mall we were on the other side and we're walking past and we had just got there so we're kind of getting a layout of the land because we'd never been there and all of a sudden my knee started hurting and I thought oh man maybe I'm supposed to go pray for that kid and I'm like uh, he's in a really big group of teenagers you know how are they going to respond to like the gospel they're probably going to laugh and just totally reject it and so I remember, I said, nah, whatever. And I kept walking. And we kept walking. And then all of a sudden, the pain started to go away in my leg. And I remember thinking to myself, I think that was God. And God spoke to me. The Holy Spirit spoke to me in that moment. And he said, he said so clearly to me, if you would have prayed for him, I would have healed his leg. But you weren't obedient. And I think, wow, that stinks. You know what I mean? That stinks. 
And and we have to be obedient. Not being obedient is worse than being embarrassed by people. And I promise you, God will equip you for every good work, everything he's put in front of you. He will equip you to do it. You just have to have faith and obedience, and that will be your magic your magic formula for making it happen. Trust and faith. Number two is this. When we go out, we have to be filled with the love of God. In going, we have to be filled with the love of God. If you don't have the love of God, you don't have anything to give. We're not going to do humanitarian efforts and stuff like that. We're going with one goal in mind. And the number one goal in mind is that people would encounter Jesus, that people would have a relationship with Jesus, that we would stir hunger in people, that we would be salt and light to people, and that they would come to know Jesus. Do we do that by doing good works? Yes, absolutely. It talks about that in Matthew chapter 6. We do that by showing good works. But that's not, the, that's not our number one goal is just to do good things. The number one goal is that people would fall in love with Jesus, that people would enter into a relationship with him. And I have to have the love of God if I'm going to give the love of God. You, you understand that? Th think about this with me. I like to use this analogy a lot. Okay, if, if, if you're not filled up and you're not living in the love of God, you haven't been spending time with Jesus, this is important. How can I give something I don't have myself? That's almost like me going out and saying, I'm going to give Joanne 20 bucks. And I pull my wallet out and I don't have 20 bucks in my wallet. I can't give something I don't have. So I think one of the number one things is you, need, you and I need to spend time with Jesus before we go. We need to be filled with the love of God so we can show the love of God. The first commandment is this, that you would love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like it, though it's not the same. I'll throw that in there. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So number two is to love your neighbor as yourself. But number the number two commandment to love your neighbor as yourself is an overflow of the first and greatest commandment. That's why that's why I think he says he says it's like it. It's an overflow of it. So so here's the thing, Joanne, you better have 20 bucks. Um, so here's the thing is I can't give what I don't have. I, I just don't have it. You know what I mean? So so I can't go out and say, hey, you know, be reconciled to God. If I'm not reconciled to God myself, I can't say, you know, Jesus loves, you know, I can't give somebody love. I can, I can always say Jesus loves you, but I can't give what I don't have. I need to be filled up. I need to be firm in the love of God when I'm going to share the love of God. God is love and anything that's not of God is not love. And here's the thing. I think if we're, if we're giving any other kind of love, it's a false love. It's not real love. And that's what we need to understand. I, I need to be filled with the love of God because I need people to encounter the love of God so they can encounter Jesus, so they can enter into a relationship with him. I need to be in the secret place. I need to be spending time with him. That's what I need. <clears throat> And I, I think of 1 Corinthians 13. We need the love of God. We need to, when we're out praying for people and sharing the gospel with people, we need to do it in love. Jesus, Jesus did it in love. That's what we need to understand. 1 Corinthians 13 says that you could go prophesy, you could go speak in tongues, you could you know, do all the great work, sell everything you have, live your life as a missionary, and then die on a cross. And if you have not love in your heart, it profits you nothing. I, think about that with me. It profits you nothing. I'm like, come on, Jesus, can't I get like a, a little something? You know, can I get a little mansion or something in heaven? I don't know. You know, and that that's what I, I think of is like it, it all has to be rooted and grounded in the love of God. That's the number one most important thing is that we would have the love of God. Number three I have for you guys, when we're going out, we need to be filled with the power of God. Not a weird power, but the power of God to pray for the sick, to to share words with people, to encourage people. That's an all an overflow of the Holy Spirit. I need the Holy Spirit to do that. I'm not that encouraging in my own strength. I'm not that loving in my own strength, to be honest. I'm, you know, I'm just not. But I have Jesus. I have the Holy Spirit. I need to rely on him for power. And, it, you know, the gospel is not just in word, but it's in power. 
So, so we not only need to show people the love of God and preach the gospel to them, but we need to show them the power of God as well. That's why we need to pray for the sick. We need to, you know, cast out demons and cleanse lepers and do those things that, that, they, would, that they would see the good works and that they would glorify their Father in heaven. That's what's important. That, that's important to all of us. And understand this, you're not the source of power. The Holy Spirit's the source of power. So we need to seek, seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit, seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit, spending time in the presence of God. That's so important if you're going to be out sharing the gospel. Again, I can't give what I don't have. If I, if I don't have 20 bucks, I can't give somebody 20 bucks. I just can't do it. I would say this too, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, be present with the Holy Spirit. Understand that he's with you. Be aware that he's with you. When you're praying for somebody, be aware that the Holy Spirit's with you. I think there's so much power in that. And sometimes I think the Holy Spirit's not moving, maybe because we're just not acknowledging him. Maybe we're just not giving him enough time. Maybe we're just doing it in our own strength and we're not leaning into the Holy Spirit, our helper, our comforter, our teacher. Maybe we're just not leaning into him enough. So when we go out, I would encourage us, encourage all of you guys who listen, when you go out and share the gospel, lean into Jesus. Lean into the power of the Holy Spirit because you don't have power without the Holy Spirit. Uh, I, you know, we talk about the gifts of the Spirit. When I teach on the gifts of the Spirit, I always tell people one thing. They're not your gifts. They're the Holy Spirit's gifts to give. So, so, so he's the one who chooses. He's the one who has the power. I technically don't have the power, but him in me has the power. And you need the Holy Spirit. If you're going to get a word for somebody, you need the Holy Spirit. You need the power of the Spirit. If you're going to pray for the sick, you need the power of the Holy Spirit. If you're going to preach the gospel, you need the power of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, it's pretty weak. It's, it's, not, that, it's not that great without the power of the Holy Spirit, without the presence of the Holy Spirit. We, so we need to be filled with power. We need, we need, first of all, we, just, we need to go because Jesus told us, go. Go, therefore, and preach the gospel. That's number one. Number two is, is we have to go in the love of God. We have to be filled with the love of God because I can't give what I don't have. I need to be filled with power, again, because I can't give what I don't have. Number four is this, and this is an important one, and I want to share this with you guys. Be humble. Be humble. Humility. Understand, Philippians chapter 2, Jesus yoked himself to humility. It says that, that he sat, he, you know, the Son of God, the creator of the universe, humbled himself to become a man, humbled himself to become a bond servant of men, and and then he humbled himself even more to die the death that you and I deserve. Jesus was the ultimate act of humility. His life was the ultimate act of humility. Dying on the cross was the God dying on a cross was the ultimate act of humility. I love what I forget who said it, but he said, you know how God flexes his muscles? He dies on a cross. He's humble and he's lowly. And, and, you know, he flexes his muscles by dying on a cross. Like, that's who our God is. And we have to understand that. But we need to be humble. Let me say this. In evangelism, there is only one goal. And the one goal is not to build our churches or to build our ministries. That is totally wrong. Totally wrong. Is it a benefit? Yes, it is. It is a benefit that our churches might fill up more if we're actually doing the stuff Jesus told us to do. But that's not the number one goal. The number one goal has to always be the gospel. You see, pride comes in and pride tells us, I need to do this to build my church. I need to do this to build my ministry. You, all right, you're already off. You're already off. It's, it's, it's not, that's not the goal. That was never the goal. Jesus didn't say, go build your church. He said, go build the kingdom. You know what I mean? Bring people into the kingdom. Invite them to the wedding. Reconcile them back to God. That's the goal. So when we go, that's the number one goal. We can't let pride slip in and say, look at me. You know what I mean? And sometimes we do that. Sometimes, you know, we could be prone to kind of boast a little bit when we're more bold than other people. And, you know, kind of take our high seat. But if we're going to go, we need to be humble. We need to be lowly like Jesus because that's how... That's how he went. He was he was yoked to humility and lowliness, but also he was in it says in Acts ten thirty eight that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power to go about doing good and healing all those who are oppressed by the enemy. That's what we need. 
That's what we need. We need to be humble. We need the power, but we need to be humble too. I, I, I really have a hard time believing that God's going to use you in mighty power if you don't have a humble spirit. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a Luke 14 mindset. Jesus gives this parable about the table and he says, he says, when you come in and sit at the table, don't sit at the highest seat at the table. Like if you're invited and, and he's actually showing a picture of like a U shaped table. That's what he would be talking about in this scripture. And he says, you go, and the master of the feast would sit at the top of the table and you would go sit right next to him, the highest seat in the place next to the master. And he says, no, 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 don't do that. He said, actually go to the last seat and then you'll receive honor because people will say, what are you doing sitting in that seat? You should be up higher. What are you doing sitting in this seat? You should be up higher, you know? And people recognize the humility. People, you know, people see the humility. And when we humble ourselves, it's important when we're sharing the gospel because people see that. And, and I think God will exalt us and give us more power and more, more love more thing you know just he'll pour out more because we're following the example of jesus that's that's one thing we absolutely need and i think we overlook a lot is i think pride tries to creep in and say this is how we're going to build our ministry that's not the number one goal that's that's not the goal at all i mean that that's a benefit it's not the goal the goal is the gospel the goal is the kingdom build the kingdom advance the kingdom that's what we're going out to do it's not about who gets credit for it. It's not about look at me or anything like that. So we have to be careful of that. You know, we have to we have to guard our hearts when we're going out. Number five is this, and I'm going to try to go through these quick because I'm taking up all your guys' time. Number five is this. You got to be bold. You're just going to have to get a spirit of boldness. Cry out and ask the Holy Spirit. He did it for the uh, He did it for the church in the book of Acts. He did it for the disciples in the book of Acts. Go for it. Be bold. Ask the Holy Spirit for boldness. Really do. I would encourage you to do that. And sometimes you just have to push through and say, I'm doing this. I'm doing this. And I know, I don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to be bold enough to go do this. And I don't know what it's going to look like. And some, some of you, some people who listen to this, you just need to get bold enough to go, go, go out with your evangelism team one time. See what it's like. I've heard so many testimonies of people going out with the evangelism team for the first time and saying, man, that was so awesome. I, I'm joining the team. I'm joining the team. And I think me and Joanne have even had that conversation when the evangelism team first started and we we're seeing who was actually going to be on board and stuff. And I said, you know, once people see and once people go out and do it, they're going to want to be a part of it because God's going to do awesome things. That's all there is to it. When, when God's people are obedient, God shows up. That's it. And that's what we have to understand. So we need to be bold. <clears throat> Number six is this, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, is we have to invite people into a loving relationship and don't try to, try to scare them into heaven. So when you go out and you preach the gospel, invite people to a relationship with Jesus. Don't try to scare them out of hell. It, you know, that, that's what we do a lot. That's, uh, and I don't think it's effective. I don't see where Jesus did that. I, I'm, I'm, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, but show me where he walked up to sinful people and told them, you're going to go to hell when you die if you don't accept me. Like, I just don't think that's the most effective way to preach the gospel. It says right here in the verse we read earlier that Jesus did not impute their trespasses against them. Meaning he did not hold their guilt in their face and say, you're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty. Jesus didn't do that. It even says, read, read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses, uh, I think, 19. He, he did not impute their trespasses against them, but he reconciled them to God. That's what we're called to do. And we've been given that same ministry, the ministry of reconciliation through Christ. So we are called to reconcile people back to God, not to hold their sins in their face, not to say, you know what is going to happen when you die? If you don't give your life to Jesus, you're going to go to hell. Sometimes that works. Sometimes it's not the most effective. I, I, I just tell you that. Sometimes people don't want to hear that. And I would say this. I don't think it's an effective way to lead somebody into a relationship with Jesus because now, okay, I scared them into receiving Jesus. I don't think fear is a good play, a good foundation to build on. I think love is. Love is a good foundation to build on. So when we, when we fear people into the gospel, we're laying a foundation that that relationship is based on fear. So, so you know, the, the relationship's based on fear. That's all there is to it. And, and, you know, it's, you know, and shame and guilt. Like, I'm not worthy. I'm, I'm just this broken piece of trash. No, Jesus loved them. Jesus loves them so much. And he says, 
He says, I'm not holding your trespasses against you. He actually looks at the Corinthian church in First Corinthians chapter 1 and calls them holy. You know, holy and righteous. If you read the book of Corinthians, the Corinthian church was nothing, looked nothing like holiness or righteousness in any way, shape, or form. And yet, Paul recognizes them in the grace of God. Not, not in their sin, not in their trespasses. He doesn't hold them in their face. He does correct them about them. He does correct the followers of Jesus, but he doesn't hold them in their face. He correct, just corrects them. I want to tell you this too, and this is a side note. Sorry, Joanne, I'm taking a lot of time, but um, here's the thing. The, I guess the best way to say this is I just don't think that's a solid foundation to build on. And I think when we hold people's sins against them, it's it's not doing them any good. It's it's not doing anything for them. And we have to understand that like God isn't guilting us. He isn't shaming us. Why would we do it to somebody else? But the main point I want to make in this that just popped in my head is this is that you can't you can't be mad at sinners for sinning. Like that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Like I can't be mad at a sinner for sinning because he's a sinner. I can't hold somebody that I'm preaching the gospel to out on the streets to a standard they haven't met yet. They haven't met grace. They haven't met Jesus. So why am, why am I going to hold them to his standards? I'm, I shouldn't be shocked at the sinfulness of the world because they're sinners. They're living in their identity. Until they get a new identity in Christ and become reconciled to God, they will continue to be sinners. I promise you that. That's all there is to it. So, so understand that with me too, is sometimes us going out and correcting people and pointing out all their wrongs is not the effective way to preach the gospel. It reaches nobody in, in, in honesty. I, I don't think I've ever really seen somebody out on the streets give their life to Christ in that, but I have seen us share the love of God with people and people break down. Even when we were in Columbus a few weeks ago, we, we didn't have many encounters. It was freezing cold and I had nothing but a hoodie because I forgot my coat and and I remember this guy came up to me and a group of uh, three other people, and he had crack in his hand. He showed it to us and said, "I, you know, we preached the gospel, shared the gospel. He told me he was offended at God, and that he walked away from God and he was about to go smoke crack. But he told me there's something about you guys that's different, and I just want to be around you guys. I don't even want to go smoke crack right now. I just want to be around you guys. And I told him, I said, that's the presence of God. You're feeling the presence of God. You're feeling the love of God. And we hugged him and we loved on him and all that stuff. And, but could you imagine if I said, you know, you, you're going to go smoke that crack rack, you're going to hell, you know, like he would have never listened to a word I had to say. That's all there is to it. And that's just me simplifying the story. But, um, number seven is this, and then I'll let you guys go. When we're out, be quick to pray for people. I, I, the reason I say that is this, you might be like, why, why is it just like pray for people first? I found that in doing evangelism, in going, when you go, first of all, prayer is simple for us. Most of us have prayed for people before. And I'll tell you this, my experience on the streets, almost almost 85, I'd say, percent of people will not turn down prayer. If you ask to pray for them, they'll say, yeah, you could pray for me. Sometimes they get a little weirded when you say, okay, let me, let me lay hands on your shoulder. You know, they're like, oh, I thought you were going to pray for me at home. Like, but, but no, I'm going to pray for you right now, right here on the street. And, but, but most of them won't reject it. Most of them are actually happy to receive it. And it is a beautiful open door to share the gospel. Even let's say when you're at the grocery store, you know, your cashier, it's just you and your cashier in line and you have a little conversation with them. Hey, can I pray for you real quick before I go? You know, you pray for them right there. And then you say, Hey, I just want to tell you like Jesus loves you so much. And, and blah, 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 you know, share your, share a little blurb. It's not hard to do. You don't have to be, have a Bible, ton of Bible knowledge. You don't have to be a theologian to do something like that. That, and that's the gospel. That's the gospel. You know, we have to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We're called to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world right now. And, and like I asked you guys last week, if we don't, who will like, who, who will go for me? Who, who, will, who will go if we don't? How are they going to hear the gospel if we don't go? How, how will they hear the gospel unless there's a preacher sent? That's what, you know, Romans said. 
uh, you know, how beautiful are the feet of messengers because they go and they bring the gospel to people through simple love and obedience. That's what's important. There's an entire world out, out there. Let me tell you guys this. There is an entire world out there right now waiting for an encounter with Jesus and they don't even know it yet. An entire world of people waiting for an encounter with Jesus and they don't even know it. And you know how God's going to encounter them? Through you and through me and through other people going out, being the love of God, walking in the power of God, being bold, you know, being humble and sharing the gospel and praying for people. This is how we're going to reach. This is how we're going to reach people. It, it's the gospel is simple. Let me tell you, I, you know, I think of, I think of where Paul says, you know, I, I forget where it's at. It's in Corinthians somewhere, but you know, he says, he says, I fear for you that somehow as the serpent deceived Eve in the garden, he has also deceived you. He has also deceived you away from the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you guys, this isn't a complicated gospel. It's love. It's light. It's Jesus. It's reconciling a world back to God who's already paid a price for them. And we just get to go invite them. We're the servants in the, mar in the marriage invitation passage. We're the ones who get to go and say, come to Jesus. You're invited to the wedding. He's not holding guilt and shame in your face. He loves you so much. Come to Jesus. All he wants in return is your heart. All he wants in return is a relationship with you. Amen? Amen. Sorry I kept you guys so long. Um, I kind of got into my flow a little bit. and It was fun, though. I had a really good time. Hey, can we also, a lot of you guys weren't on here earlier. Joanne is doing some awesome stuff with the evangelism team. Throw some like emoji love, share this video, hit some likes, invite your friends to the page to like it. I think she's doing an awesome job, even finding ways to share the gospel, share, you know, the love of God, finding ways to do outreach in the middle of quarantine. It is awesome. And I just want to give her props and say good job. So I'm going to pray for you guys real quick and we'll jump back on here again next week. Hopefully I won't be as long. Um, but thank you guys for listening in. It was a good time and uh, love you guys. So Father, we just, we love you and we thank you so much. We bless your name and we ask God that you would be lifted high. We ask that you would be magnified. And I pray right now, God, that you would give faith to the person who's faithless. I pray right now that the person who doesn't have boldness and is scared to go, that they would quit giving into fear and that they would give in, that they would step into a new and fresh boldness and that they would get into the secret place with you and they'd be filled with love. They'd be filled with power. They'd be filled with grace to go do the things that you've called them to do. Father, we love you so much. And I pray that as we go, the gospel would be preached, God, that people would know that they're loved, that people would feel and encounter the love of God like never before. And they would walk away amazed and in awe of who you are. Holy Spirit, would you come and would you fill each home represented here tonight? We love you. We bless you. We give you all the glory in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you guys. Thank you guys for tuning in. I'll see you guys next week.